Hi, welcome. It's nice to see you. This is my first time in front of like a live studio audience. I feel like, you know, I don't know, that guy from The Price is Right. So uh, welcome. It is really great to see everybody and welcome to everybody out there in cyberspace. I will say that the last year has taught us a profound lesson and it's kind of a contradictory lesson. One is online events and the ability to reach a global audience with uh, Nelson programming and experience and, and stories is amazing. This year has actually been incredibly productive and we've met new people literally all around the world and you're out there and welcome back as always. But it also taught me how much I miss human beings. <laughs> and here we are with human beings in the house. Thank you for joining us this evening for the Jordahl Public Lands Lecture. I'm Paul Robbins. I'm Dean of the Nelson Institute for Environmental Studies here at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And this is a great night for us, like I said, because this is our first hybrid event of the season. And hopefully if it works, we'll do a bunch more. And to those of us who are joining virtually, again, I want to say thank you. We're grateful for a very global community that you are a part of who's really supported us over the last 18 months. Almost everybody who's here in the house probably joined us online at some point over the last 18 months. I don't want to take a minute at the outset to reflect on the reason that uh, we offer this lecture, which is a, a one that has been here since I arrived a decade ago. And that's Wisconsin's long, distinguished, history of environmental leadership, conservation, and stewardship, especially around public lands. Public land, say it with me. Here in Wisconsin, we all owe a debt of gratitude to Harold, better known as Bud Jordahl, in exactly this space. Bud Jordahl is more than merely a namesake for this lecture. This is Jordahl lecture, right? He was a visionary, and he dedicated his life to preserving Wisconsin's natural resources. He also worked very closely with Gaylord Nelson, uh, the namesake of this institute, who was U.S. Senator, Wisconsin Governor, and Earth Day founder. Uh, only just one of those would be pretty much pretty awesome. That's, uh, that's a triple. I'm told that the two of them, Bud and, uh, and Gaylord, were quite a pair, tremendously down to earth, absolutely unstoppable when they set their minds out to do things. And they did a lot. Bud was instrumental in helping establish the Apostle Islands National Lakeshore, the Northern Great Lakes Visitor Center, Wisconsin's Knowles Nelson Stewardship Fund, which is just a fundamental piece of public policy in service of the environment and the, and, and the community. And a lot more. If I had to like do a whole story about Bud, we'd be here all night. He was also a professor of urban and regional planning, extension, and environmental studies. He inspired hundreds, I'd say probably thousands, of students at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. His service to the state of Wisconsin was dedicated, honorable, and right on transformative. The Jordahl Lecture Series was established 10 years ago as a way to honor Bud's legacy and about the uh, critical role of public lands in our society. It's a way for us to remember that we have public land. These are public lands. They are the people's land. Thank you for taking part in the conversation this evening and for being a part of this legacy. The Nelson Institute's always uh, prided itself on being a place that puts community first. Most recently, we've made a conscious decision to showcase as many emerging and diverse leaders as we can. The public is an inclusive, expansive, total collective. It's not just to everybody who showed up in 1975, but we treasure them too. We believe that the environmental solutions that we need are gonna come from everyone and only by listening to everybody. Tonight then, it's an honor to have Shelton Johnson with us. Shelton will be joining us virtually from Yosemite National Park, so he got the better end of the deal. Shelton's a park ranger and Yosemite National Park's community engagement specialist. He's also a 34-year veteran of the National Park Service, a servant to the public's land. For the past 25 years, Shelton has worked on connecting African Americans and other people of color to the national parks, using history as a tool for social change. Shelton is tasked with increasing relevancy, diversity, and inclusion in the park, and he's described his role, in his words, as helping to forge and deepen lasting connections 
between all communities of color and our national parks. Shelton's work has received media coverage in publications ranging from the New York Times. You would have seen him in Ken Burns and Day Dayton Duncan's PBS documentary film, The National Parks, America's Best Idea. He's a rock star. And while I'd love to have him in person, he gets to stay in Yosemite and still fill us with wonder. I'm also pleased to introduce to you James Edward Mills, who's here in person with us tonight to moderate the discussion and is going to run the show here once you get the loudmouth off the stage. James is uh, the Nelson Institute's Community Partnership Liaison, and he also teaches a summer course. Big shout out to anybody online here, a, a course called Outdoors for All, which focuses on diversity, equity, and inclusion in outdoor recreation and in public land management, public lands, people's lands. James is also a freelance journalist, media producer, and founder of the Joy Trip Project. Before we turn our attention to the main event, I'd like to offer two sets of thanks. The first thanks are extended to the individuals and organizations who financially supported this event. The following organizations are our official event partners tonight, and we have many, thank goodness. The Aldo Leopold Nature Center, get out there, bring your kids. The Cherish Wisconsin Outdoors Fund of the Natural Resources Foundation of Wisconsin, Gathering Waters, Groundswell Conservancy, the Wisconsin Academy of Sciences, Arts, and Letters, 1,000 Friends of Wisconsin, the Wisconsin oh. Association for Environmental Education, long time partners, the Nelson Institute Center for Culture, History, and Environment, the pride of environmental humanities for this campus. The UW-Madison Department of Planning and Landscape Architecture, longtime friends. The UW Department of Forest and Wildlife Ecology, where we have such close ties. And the Joy Trip Project. Before I turn things over to James and Shelton, I'd like to draw your attention to something else. Something that I would like you to bear in mind as we begin our conversation about the people's lands, as in which people. The University of Wisconsin-Madison, is located on ancestral Ho-Chunk land, a place their nation is called Dejok since time immemorial. And in 1832 treaty, the Ho-Chunk were forced to cede this territory, land they had stewarded for thousands of years, and which remains a vital part of their identity and heritage here in Wisconsin now, amongst Ho-Chunk people here and now. The University of Wisconsin-Madison values both our partnership with the Ho-Chunk and the other sovereign tribal nations of Wisconsin, and the voices of all indigenous people across the world. We honor the strength and resilience in protecting the land and aspire to uphold our responsibilities according to their example. Thank you very much for coming. James, it is all yours, sir. Well, good evening, everyone, and thank you very much for coming this evening. Um, Paul, thank you very much for that wonderful introduction, and um, I'm very grateful to be here to speak with you this evening, um, and also to introduce one of my very good friends. Now, many of you were probably introduced to Shelton Johnson much the way that I was um, by the Ken Burns documentary, The National Parks, America's Best Idea. And what was especially interesting to me was that I literally was introduced to him by Ken Burns. Um, in the, the fall of, of 2009, I actually had the pleasure of visiting Yosemite National Park and meeting for the first time Shelton Johnson. Um, because it was in, in an interview that I did with Ken Burns and discussion of how the National Parks film was going to resonate with underrepresented segments of the population, he proceeded to tell me the story of the Buffalo Soldiers. And as a person who grew up in California, as a person who lived and taught in Yosemite Valley for many, many, many years, at the age of 42, this is the first time that I'd ever heard this story before. And as an African-American, it profoundly impacted my interest in protecting and preserving not only our public lands, but also the stories that make them possible. And I quite literally learned much of what I know now about the Buffalo Soldiers from our guests this evening. Um, Shelton, I'd like to introduce you to our, our wonderful audience here in Wisconsin. Um, first of all, tell us, right now you are in um, actually Mariposa, um, not yes. necessarily in Yosemite, but you are um, now in the field office in Mariposa. Welcome 
to the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Thank you, James. It's a pleasure to be here and to be there at the same time. <laughs> Well, I would, I'd love to have you um, tell us just a bit about um, your narrative and how it is that you came to work and um, be the steward of public land at Yosemite. You know, how much time do you have? I mean, yeah. my life story, I mean, it's, it's complex because to a great degree, you and I and the audience that I cannot see but can see me are having this conversation because of a childhood that now seems remote, not geologically remote, but certainly in the, the human sense remote. Uh, I, when I was five years old, I was with my mom and dad. My father was stationed in Germany and we lived in a little town called Kontwisch near a bigger town called Zweibrücken. And there was a family trip to Berchtesgaden and it was high in the Bavarian Alps near the border with Austria. And what I remember is not the geographical specificity of that, what I remember is the visual and sensory impact of that experience of being high up in a precipice, looking out into, into the depths below, seeing the shadows, seeing the shadows of the clouds below me, seeing clouds below me. I was felt, I was at the apex of, of that edge between space and between earth itself. And the only thing that kept me from being blown off from that precipice were the hands of my father and the hands of my and the hand of my mother, which kept me bound to that space. And it really was one of those moments where you literally are being blown out of yourself into some much vaster environment. And when you're five years old, it was overwhelming. And when you're 50 years old, it should be just as overwhelming. And the key thing to this communication is that I never forgot that moment. That moment stayed with me. My mother has passed away. My father has passed away. My brother has passed away. All who were with me, who were family, who were kindred, have all passed away. And maybe they're in that abyss. Maybe they're in that light. But they cannot be connected to me physically today. But through memory, I still remember that experience. And what's profound about that particular moment in my own life is that that moment was the seed. That moment was that little crystalline spark that just was waiting for some point of ignition within my spirit. And I held on to it and, and I needed to because you know we eventually, we returned to Detroit. And I need to tell everyone here that's listening uh, to me at this point that there is very little resemblance between inner city Detroit and Austria, in particular, the Bavarian Alps. And so when you're an inner city African-American kid and you can close your, your eyes and you can visualize these high, peaks covered in snow with banners of snow being flung off from them and ice crystals in the air when the wind would blow. When you can visualize that, you're not thinking it's a memory. You're thinking it's a fantasy of some sort, something that you hold up to yourself that will be in comparison and contrast to the asphalt and concrete and glass and steel of this industrial city that we know as Detroit. But my mom had to explain to me that this was a memory, but it was such a powerful memory that if it, had, if it had not taken place, I doubt very strongly that we would be having a conversation about this today. That's the power of a childhood experience in the mountains or in the desert or in the forest. It is, it is a baptism. It is an, a door opening. It is a portal to the spirit and to the universe itself. And when you're five years old, there's no adult faculty to keep that out. You're open to the universe and the universe is open to you. And that is why I'm a ranger today. Now, I much of your career, I, I, I'll leave it to the audience to <laughs> answer the question. Well, much of your career um, has been spent working in national parks and um, I remember you telling me, and I think you tell this story in the documentary and film about the very first time you got off the bus at Yellowstone. Can you share with us yeah. a little bit about that moment and seeing a bison for the first time in, in Yellowstone National Park? Yeah, because you know the thing that's important to keep in mind is that after I had that experience in Germany in the Bavarian Alps, there was just city. It was a city. I, we moved from there to London, England, where my father was also stationed. We moved from there to South Carolina, and then essentially Kansas City, and then back to Detroit. And so most of my childhood memories are of Detroit. And as I said, it was just concrete, steel, asphalt, 
Um, it was a completely different environment. Um, so when I finally made that journey into Montana and Wyoming and, Yellow, and, and Yellowstone, into the region, not just the park, but the region that we call Yellowstone, the, the, the landscape we call Yellowstone, it was a return. It felt like I had the same sort of sense of connection and homecoming that I had when I arrived in Germany or Germany and the Alps arrived in me. And so it seemed like I was, and I never, I'm not from Montana. I was born in Detroit. I'm not from Wyoming. I was born in Henry Ford Hospital. But when I arrived in Yellowstone and that, and I saw the, the bison in, in Hayden Valley and also up at Mammoth Hot Springs, when I saw those bison, I felt like I, it was a homecoming. And uh, it was a very strange experience to be in a new world, but that world felt kindred. It felt like it was a place that you had a blood relationship with. And again, that's the power of having those early national park experiences. Um, there's, you go anywhere else in the world and it's a homecoming. So when it comes to your role as a park ranger, but also as a person of color, what was your experience like being one of the very few black American park rangers in a place like Yellowstone in um, the mid eighties? Well, you know, I, I would go beyond just being one of the very few. It was just myself. <laughs> it was myself and Gillian Bowser. Gillian Bowser, who I, I still communicate with today. You know, she was a she is a scientist, and uh, but she was you know she wore civilian clothes. I was in the in the uniform, uh, so I never saw myself reflected uh, in terms of another individual who looked like me or was even a, a person of color like me. Um, wearing the uniform. So I felt in those first few years as a Yellowstone National Park Ranger that I was the only African-American in the National Park Service. And that, that was an estrangement, but at the same time, I felt that I had a responsibility to do my absolute best, which is what I was taught to do by my parents, is that military discipline. You know, it doesn't matter what kind of obstacle is in front of you. You have, you have a job to do, you have a duty to fulfill, and you do it to your utmost abilities and you represent not just yourself, but the people who gave you life. And, and so I held that in my heart and my spirit, and I just did my best to do my best and be at my best at all times. So it was a struggle because I was the only one uh, in uniform. So the result was I had absolutely no anonymity. I could never say, make a mistake and just guess at an answer because if I did, a visitor would just say to another ranger in another part of the park, well, this ranger told us that, uh, you know, the bison, uh, they, they uh, uh, sprout wings. Uh, and then they fly off in the wintertime in some sort of migration. Uh, and obviously they don't, but the, the, the ranger who would have listened to that would have said, well, who said that? And he says, we don't know. We never got his name. Oh, I'm sorry, we can't help you. Oh, but it was a black guy. Oh, Shelton. Because <laughs> <laughs> I was the only African-American ranger in a uniform. I mean, period. And I was only one of two working in the park at the time. And so it was a burden to a great degree to not always be right, but always be very uh, circumspect about how I answered a question. And if I didn't know the answer, I learned early on to simply say, I don't know the answer to that, but I will take some time and find out what the answer is. If you give me your, your phone number, I'll, I'll make sure that you get the answer that you're looking for, or not that you're looking for, the answer that's true. Uh, and, and I was just very uh, keen on making certain that I was always you know, spot on. And that if I didn't know, just at the outset, just say, I'm sorry, I don't know the answer, but I can find out what that is. And so it was, a, it was a greater burden because you didn't have that anonymity. You were really just out there and everyone knew that you were there and present. So, uh, but you know, you just adjust to it and you move forward. Yeah, I think that it's really important, especially as many of us are, are not only fans of the national park system, but we're also um, avid users and visitors of our national park system. I'm really curious to know, um, just as a value, um, for the American people, but also people around the world. Why are the national parks so important to our roles as citizens in this country? I would go a step further and say that national parks are more important than we even give them credit for. Meaning we talk about, we think about them and talk about them as, as biosphere reserves, as uh, areas for, for diversity uh, in terms of wildlife, but it's even deeper than that. When we're in a wilderness area, we're in a place that has been undisturbed or relatively undisturbed. And we are the first species in the, in the evolutionary history of this planet that is on the, on the precipice of making itself alien to its own world. 
We treat the earth and see the earth as a resource. I don't like the word resource. I would never refer to my mom as a resource or my dad as a resource because there is this kindred, emotional, spiritual connection between myself and my forebears. And I feel that same sort of connection between myself and the space around me, the earth around me, the sky above me. There's a deep connection and that connection is on the borderline spirit, actually it's beyond the edge of, of spirituality. It's the only world we've ever known. And to reduce that world, to reduce that construct to something that's dollarable, as John Muir once said, that, that nothing dollarable is safe. And, and that's one of the reasons why parks and landscapes and environments can never be commodified, can never be turned into uh, something that has a, a tag on it for sale because it's beyond anything that can be priced. It is something that is an externalization of ourselves as living beings. And, and, and there's no separation between the two. We are alive because the earth is alive. And because the earth is alive, we are alive as well. And, we, and that connection is, is so important that if we lose it, we lose ourselves, we lose everything. Now, I know that one of the, I think, pivotal moments in your career was discovering a photograph of black men in uniform circa 1903. And I wonder if you can take us back to that moment when you discovered um, something that I think had a pretty profound effect on your, on your life. And that was the discovery of what we now know as the Buffalo Soldiers. Um, how did that, moment impact both your career and you, your role as a storyteller in Yosemite? You know, it's funny, James. I, I, I'll never forget that moment because what I saw, I saw five African-American men in, a uni in uniform, an army uniform, staring at me from a distance of 100 years. And we don't tend to think of time as being a distance that's spatial, but it's both a distance that was spatial and temporal. And so when I looked into their eyes, I could sense and feel that their eyes were looking into mine. And I recognized that my uniform as a park ranger to a great degree was an echo, a textile echo of the uniform that they wore because when the Park Service was created in 1916, the uniform really closely matched the cavalry, the army uniforms of the day so that we would be perceived in the same sort of sense of law enforcement that literally the military was perceived. So when I saw those soldiers, I didn't just see nameless soldiers staring at me. I looked beyond the, 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 the official capacity that, that they were garbed in, into their eyes, and I saw my father, and I saw my grandfather. I saw my family because I saw their hair, I saw their skin, I saw their face, and I saw a mirror within which I was reflected. And when you look at the history and you see yourself reflected, then you have literally gone into a different world because to a great degree, we cannot fully retrieve the past. Most of the past is lost. Most of the past is hidden the way that an iceberg and that nine tenths of that iceberg is beneath the surface. And so much of that we can never really grasp hold of. But so when I was looking at that photograph, it was like a time machine, a portal, and I saw myself in that world and everything shifted beneath my feet as if the, the earth moved. And it was in, an incredibly powerful moment because in that one glance, I felt kindred, I felt that I was connected. I no longer felt like a stranger. I no longer felt like an alien. I felt like I had come home because men who were doing what I do today were doing the exact same duties to a great degree a hundred years ago that these African-American soldiers were serving in that official role of park protector before the park service was even formed, before there was any such thing as a national park ranger. So for, for you know, months, me thinking, or, or over a few years, me thinking that I was a pioneer, I found out that they were the pioneers and that I was a, was a, a relative newcomer. And that really gave me this anchoring that uh, I had been longing for. And that one visual image brought me to that home, to that place. Now, you're a very talented storyteller. And much of what you do is recount the experience of Buffalo Soldiers in period dress and clothing. And if anybody is interested in, in seeing Chilton perform um, a Buffalo, Holder, Hold, a Buffalo Shoulder, Soldier Speaks, 
I definitely recommend you go to visit Yosemite Valley and, and watch this amazing show. How difficult was it to create the persona, the character, the personage of that moment in time to bring that character live in person to speak to visitors to the park today? Well, you know, to some degree, it wasn't that difficult because all you need is a revelation. All you need is to stand up, look up into the sky, and there's a bolt of, uh, of lightning, uh, and, and you were illuminated. And so when I saw those soldiers, I saw my father, and I saw the men that were of my father's generation. My father served in Berlin just after World War II, so he saw Berlin in ruins. He was in the infantry. He was an expert marksman in Korea. He was in combat. Uh, during Vietnam, he switched to telecommunications. I don't know how he managed to do that, but he, he did that because I guess he wanted to come home. And I, I, and I certainly I can understand that, but he was in the Viet, Viet, Vietnam War as well. And so when I saw those soldiers in that photograph, I saw my family, I saw my father, and I saw to some degree my grandfather, who was a black Cherokee from Oklahoma territory, born in the same year, 1903, that the, 19th, that the 9th Cavalry arrived in both Yosemite and Sequoia National Park. So that, uh, that photograph really just told me to some degree that, uh, that literally uh, that flame, that light of communication of history was being passed to me. And I had to hold it aloft and do what I could to illuminate what had been in darkness. And, and that to, to some degree is uh, what my job is. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking to you in a matter of fact tone and, and people, when they think of interpretive rangers, they use that word interpretation, which often is confused as someone who speaks a different language. But from my point of view, I facilitate astonishment because that's what I felt when I saw that photograph. So I tell folks, I'm an astonishment facilitator. And when you are, are walking in, in Yosemite Valley and you're telling folks that granite is a plutonic igneous rock. And I say, well, what's a plutonic igneous rock? Well, it's the underbelly of ancient volcanoes. And what you're looking at would normally be called lava if it extruded out into the surface of the earth, but it was hidden, closeted, deep beneath the crust, cooled and crystallizes until the forces of erosion, which is mostly water, oh, cleared it away. So it was like a sculpture that was preordained, that was sitting there locked up in darkness and silence until it was revealed by, by this process of erosion by glacial ice. And, it's, it's, it's like a da-da that a magician does, but it's taking place in geologic time. So I felt that similar sense of, of something being revealed, that there was a revelation at hand just from looking at that photograph. And I, I never forgot that moment of just that sense of kinship when I saw and looked into their eyes and I felt that their eyes were looking into mine. I knew I had to tell a story from that point on. So now your official title is a community outreach specialist. You know, and I'm curious, how did you get that job? I mean, I, and I love that you describe yourself as a facilitator of astonishment. Um, how is it that you came to be the um, outreach specialist that you are now? I mean, was this a job that you created or is this something that happens at all parks nationwide? Well, well let me say, James, that in the beginning, there was darkness. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't create it. It, it, it was it was created uh, because that position needed to exist because, you know, California is the most populous state in the country. And it's one of seven states where that already have a minority majority, uh, you know, population. There are millions of African-Americans, uh, millions of Latinx folks, millions of Asian-Americans that live in California. And of course, we're right on the edge of the Pacific Rim. But a lot of those uh, people of color, communities of color, don't visit the national parks. And there are more national parks in, in California than any other national park in the contiguous United States in the lower 48. So I felt that, uh, uh, that I had the responsibility and, and the park took upon itself this responsibility to reach out to these communities to make them feel, not just to speak to them in a matter of fact way, but, th but that this is democracy that can be inhabited. This is the light of a republic that we can all feel because when we go into a park, we are all the same. We may not necessarily feel that we'll be treated the same, but it's a legacy that's tied to citizenship. And as a result, it is an inheritance that's for anyone that is an American citizen. So I felt that, you know, this is like winning the lottery, you know, and, and who, who that, what individual that, is, that comes from a, a culturally diverse population would not want to feel, hey, I just won the lottery. 
And it, this is a greater lottery than because it cannot be just measured in terms of coinage, in terms of currency. It's measured in spirit, it's measured in beauty. I mean, John Muir used that phrase, beauty hunger, to describe people who were locked in cities, living in cities, but did not have this experience of being in the wild, being in the mountains, have the mountains rise within them, having the forest take root within their own spirit and then come out and leaf out within their own mind and their own heart and, and their own body. But the parks can do that. And so I felt that with this position, I had, I was in the position, in the, uh, the interposition between the people and the place to connect them with their own inheritance. And so that's a, not just a job, that's a calling. That's not just a calling, that's a gift. That's not just a gift, that's a gift that I can give to others. And I felt that that is what was needed for African-Americans in particular to reclaim that which had been taken from them due to the Middle Passage, due to slavery, due to Jim Crow and give it back because it is nothing, there is nothing more African than to connect with the earth. You talk, I worked for, for years with a, a gentleman in the visitor center who is Maasai, who's from a village below the rim of the Ngorogoro crater. And talking to him and listening to him, I could still, I could feel his connection to the Serengeti, feel his connection to that part of Africa, to, to, to Kenya, to that part of the world. And through him, I could feel my own connection. And so we see each other, we say, Jumbo, Jumbo, in the middle of Yosemite, you know, one African and talking to another person of African descent. And there was also a gentleman there from Ethiopia. So when we were three were together, I think it made it look like the civil rights movement had come to pass and it was right here in Yosemite. Because if there's three Africans in the Valley Visitor Center, then where are the other ones? You know, so it was just a very powerful thing for people to see myself, and to see Olatumi and to see Otis right there in the visitor center, an African-American from Detroit, an African that is Maasai from, from, from Kenya and then, or Tanzania, and then another African from Ethiopia. So are there plans or are there efforts afoot to try to create similar positions to yours in other parks um, to have people with your personal passion, heritage, legacy to tell similar stories. I know that you just met uh, Jerry Bransford, uh, who's a fifth generation African-American cave guide at Mammoth Caves in Kentucky. Um, he's 74 yeah. years old. He's probably gonna be retiring soon. Um, how do we correct, or perhaps, I, there's, there's no replacing you, Shelton, <laughs> but how do we create um, new stewards and storytellers to do the job that you're doing now? Well, first thing is that I, I would not discount the power of cloning. I mean, the, the, there could be another Shelton out there that, that can be created, but I think that my family would find that deeply disturbing. Uh, it's been related to me that one of me is, is just enough. That's just fine. Um, but I, I think that all we need is to reproduce the experience that I, that I experienced, meaning that, that baptism, that introduction, that, that immersion into nature at an early age. There is nothing more powerful than a national park experience, than a wilderness experience when you're very, very young because you have not created these ad adult faculties of, of these barriers that will keep that out. There's not the fear there. Fear is something that we often are taught. And so for many African-Americans, there is this top fear of the outdoors that's not rooted in slavery. It's rooted closer than that. It's rooted in the period of Jim Crow, post reconstruction. That's the, that's the that sense of oh, well, the mountains aren't for me. Being in these places, they're dangerous. And what we're connecting with are memories, these ancestral memories, just multi generational memories of the Ku Klux Klan, of these these supremacist groups that came into being after the close of the Civil War. But what we're forgetting and not connecting with are these much more ancient memories of kinship, connection, thousands and thousands of generations of Africanness, of, of our connection to that continent, which is just one aspect of the planet itself. I, so I always argue, you don't need to go to Africa to connect with that which is African. You don't need to go to a Brazil, you know, and to connect with that which is African. It's a cheaper airfare than getting to Kenya, but you don't need to do that here in America itself, here in California, here in Michigan, here in Washington State, wherever there's a national park, wherever there's wildness, if you are of African descent and you go into that space, if you are a human being of any sort 
and you go into that space, the connection will be made, not necessarily between you and that place, but the place will, will claim you if you're there long enough and if you're open to it long enough. And so that's why I feel it's so important to get young people into these parks, into these environments so that they can wake up and, see the, and be in the real world. Because that's the other perception that I've gained is that in the national parks and wilderness, that's the real world. It's surrounded by a line calling it a park, but when you're inside, it's literally the definition of wonder because it's much bigger on the inside than it is on the outside, which is how the parks, early parks became known as Wonderlands because of Lewis, Lewis Carroll and Alice in Wonderland. But you don't have to go through that little rabbit hole. You just pay an entrance fee and you can enter that same environment that is miraculous. Well, we're going to, um, in a moment, open the floor to audience questions, both here in the room, but also online. So if you've got questions, please prepare them. Um, and I do have just a couple more questions for Shelton, and then we'll move on to audience questions. Um, first of all, I'm curious to know, how has the COVID-19 pandemic and everything that's been going on over the last two years impacted your work at Yosemite? I know that you've been working remotely quite a bit, but I'm also curious to know how or whether or not the park attendance and access might be disproportional, you know, relative to underrepresented segments of the population, namely people of color in their access to the parks during the COVID-19 pandemic. How has that, that impacted the work that you do? You know, I don't know if that's actually anything that I can speak to in terms of the, the, the numbers, the, and, you know, whether or not more or fewer people of color are visiting the park and it's related to COVID. Because in order to find that answer, there would actually have to be a park ranger at each entrance station talking to these individual groups and saying, why are you here now? You know that COVID is here. Are you here because you're finding some sense of sanctuary, getting away from the cities? And, I, and indeed that appears to be the case for many people that they feel somehow that, that this is a refuge, that the parks are a refuge and they, probably feel that way because in their regular life pre, prior to COVID, they felt that parks were a refuge. But the problem is it can't be a refuge if people who have COVID-19 are also visiting the park. You know, so it's a, it's, a, it's a mixed bag. But I think it also reflects this mindset that parks are healing and by extension, nature is healing. And by even greater extension, the earth itself is healing. And so that there's a medicinal value to mountains. There's a medicinal and curative impact of being in the presence of giant sequoia. Just being in the shadow of a big tree might have some sort of curative effect on one. And it does, but I think it's more with the spirit. But if it affects the spirit in a positive sense, then it can affect the body as well. It happened to John Muir. It happened to the, the Awanishi. It happened to the Southern Sierra Miwa for thousands of years. The beauty is medicine. Beauty is not, made, not necessarily a cure-all, but it does have this, this salutary effect on the human spirit and, and on the body as well. So what do we have to look forward to in the future? I mean, as we are hopefully getting past the, the, the COVID-19 pandemic, um, we also have um, appropriations at, at, in Congress to fully fund our national parks and also the tremendous maintenance backlog that it is totaling in excess of $12 billion. Mm -hmm. What does the future look like and what do we need to do to preserve our national parks well into the future? Well, what we need to do is change our perspective. It's not about funding the Grand Canyon. It's not about funding Mount Rainier or Zion or Canyonlands or Wrangell St. Elias or Arches. Uh, it's about funding the earth because when you're in a park, you're in a, a, this portal where you can actually see and feel and hear and touch the wildness of the earth itself, the earth as it was, the earth as it is, the earth that will always be, because we are here for a very short period of time in terms of our species. And that is literally what paleontology teaches. That's what geology literally teaches. It's a much larger book. And we are not even a chapter in that book. We're not even a paragraph in that book. We're not even a sentence in that book. All of human existence is one word in that book. So what we can do is make certain that that environment that is around us is maintained. And by maintaining the parks, we create this space, this, this, this sanctuary for the earth itself from which it can blow up, it can come out again and, 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 and take over. <laughs> you know, Because that's the thing that's ironic about all of this is that um, we, we always worry about, oh, we're gonna destroy the earth. We're not gonna, we're gonna make the earth uninhabitable for ourselves. 
but the earth has all the time literally in the world because it is the world to recover from anything that we can do because it literally has hundreds of millions or billions of years and that makes a big difference but but why wait that length of time for the promised land when it's right here around us so i think the best thing to do is duplicate replicate what you find in the Grand Canyon and Zion. I mean, there's flyways for different birds. I mean, there's things that we can do and wildlife crossings in urban or rural areas uh, to make, the, make Yellowstone be more kindred to us in terms of both geography and in terms of spirit, you know, uh, because the animals don't know they're in a national park. They move around and that's why you'll find coyotes in Manhattan and you'll find coyotes in Los Angeles because they don't read the signs that say no coyotes here or no mountain lion here. They go where they go because that's what animals do, looking for new habitat, looking for other areas that might have better food. And uh, I think we can learn from that to recognize that we need to stop having these abrupt separations between cities and towns and have more of a flow between us and the world around us to live in sync with the earth around us. Uh, and I had that experience living in West Yellowstone, Montana. You know, I remember sitting around a table with one of my best friends and uh, I was, they were cooking the meal and everything. And I said, oh, there's the scraps building up here. Uh, want me to take them out to your, your, your trash can back there? And he looked at his watch and he said, no, now's not a good time. Okay, so I kept doing what I was doing, chopping up celery and so forth. Later after that dinner, I said, I asked you about taking the trash out and you said, now's not a good time. Why wasn't it a good time? And he relayed to me, that the time that I asked to take the trash out was around the same time that a grizzly bear walked up behind his house looking for food. What I learned from that is that our friendship was real. What I also <laughs> learned is that the, the, that our, the, the separation that we've created between ourselves and the natural world around us is not the way to go. We need integration, not integration in terms of of necessarily between culture and race. And race, again, is not a biological construct. It's a sociological construct. There's kingdom, phylum, subphylum, class order, family, genus, species, subspecies. Those, that categorization makes sense in a biological sense. But we need it in a geological or geographical sense. We need to stop separating ourselves from the earth and teach our children to be integrated with the earth. And that's why indigenous people, the last few, uh, what do they call them? There, there's still, uh, people out there, they call them uncontacted tribes who've never had a contact at all with the, with the modern world. Those should be our teachers. Those should be the philosophers that we listen to because they never left Eden in that Judeo-Christian sense. They're still there fully in the promised land. But when that last, that, those last human beings, if they somehow, for whatever reason, don't make it, they leave this world, they're killed off because that has happened to indigenous people in our history, then a part of ourselves as human beings will have died off as well. We need to hold on to that connection. I always think of the myth of Antaeus, that, that, that Heracles or Hercules could only beat this Greek wrestler if he, if, if he could tear him off from the ground because Antaeus, as long as his feet touched the earth, was, he could not be defeated. Well, from my point of view, the industrial revolution was that, that struggle between Hercules and Antaeus. And unfortunately at this point, Hercules, again, is, is winning, and Antaeus needs to win. We need to maintain that contact with the earth, and as long as we teach our children that kindred relationship between human, human beings, between primates and the land around us, then we have a future, and that future is bright. Wow. Thank you. Um, I would love to open up the question portion of the evening to our audience. Um, is there anyone in the audience who'd like to ask a question? Please step up to the microphone. Hey, James, I can start us off with um, An audience question from online, please. So uh, Serena's question has been upvoted. Um, so I'll ask hers. So thank you for sharing your story and with such poetry in your descriptions. I love the, my mother is not a resource reflection. Serena's question is, how do we reconcile a national park system that holds beautiful and majestic inspiration, but that is built on stolen indigenous land? What do you think of the idea of returning national parks to indigenous communities as described in a recent Atlantic article by Ojibwe author and historian, David Truer? Truer. Well, let me answer it this way. I, I am an indigenous person. 
my maternal grandparents, my maternal grandfather is, is African and Cherokee. He's from a little town called Inola, which is a Cherokee word uh, uh, and was born in Oklahoma territory. My grandmother, my maternal grandmother is from McAllister, Oklahoma, which is the second largest nation in, or second largest town in the Choctaw nation. On my father's side of the family, there's African, but there's also Seminole. So I am African, Cherokee, Choctaw, Seminole, and Irish. And of course, the Irish are the indigenous people of Ireland. So I inhabit that. I understand that, that point of view, that native point of view, as much as I can, given my, my blood ancestry. But at the same time, I'm also a realist. So my, my feet are bound to the earth although my head and my spirit is in the clouds. So I have to find that balance between the two. This is a fancy way of saying, I don't think things are gonna change that much. <laughs> but what can change is the recognition that indigenous people throughout the world, not just in the Americas, but throughout the world have a connection that is profound and they need to maintain that connection. Because as I said, we rely, we as a species may rely eventually on them to, to teach us how to be in this world because they've never forgotten what we have forgotten, what the industrial revolution did to our psyche, to our spirit, to push us away out of the light, into the darkness. They can bring us back into the light again, but we have to approach them. We have to speak to them with generosity and vulnerability and openness, not with a sense of dominance, with a sense of superiority because that is more telling than any words that you can use. So, yeah, so I see from my point of view, native people that have, are still tied to the ancestral ways, uh, they're, they're great teachers to teach us what we've not just forgotten, but what we've let go of. And that is that, that specific kinship, ancestral connection to the earth itself. Another question from the audience, Chris. I'll use the microphone here. You'll just have to flip the mic on. Go up. There's a. Yeah. There you go. Sorry about that. Thank you very much, Shelton. What a wonderful talk. My name is Alfonso Morales. I'm the chair of the Department of Planning and Landscape Architecture, and I'm here to represent the department. And I tell you what, I'm so glad I came and I look forward to the next one I get to come to. And Paul and the Nelson Institute do such a great job. My, my ancestors farm and ranch in West Texas in New Mexico and around Fort Davis, Texas, which you may know uh, mm -hmm. is the home of uh, Lieutenant uh, Flipper and uh, yes. Buffalo Soldier units of the 18. 60s and 70s, the 70s and 80s. And yes. I, I've heard a lot of stories of those communities uh, at that time. And I was just wondering uh, if, if you had uh, ever considered going, if, if you'd spent any time in, at Fort Davis and told any stories there, I tell you, I would uh, love to go visit my relatives over there and listen, take them to listen to you. Thank you very much for your time. It's a, it's a real pleasure to listen to you. Uh, well, thank you. And I, should, I have to say to you that uh, that's one of the places that I want to go before, I, not just before I die, I would like to, a long time before I pass on. Uh, I'm not one for the bucket list. I'd rather just be able to enjoy what's in the bucket and not just stare at it, you know. I'm, <laughs> so Fort Davis is high on my list. Uh, Fort Huachuca is high on my list. Fort Larned is high on my list. Uh, but I'm also just really interested in more conversations with indigenous people. And of course, right here in Yosemite, I have, I'm surrounded by indigenous people because we have an Indian culture museum that is actually staffed by California Indians, you know, by people who are Southern Sierra Miwa, the people who are, you know, uh, Chumash or Chukche. So it's just, it's like we can have, we need to have these conversations, particularly between African Americans and Native Americans, because both groups occupy a space. Uh, a position, an interposition in American history that is unique because we didn't arrive on the Mayflower. We didn't arrive at Plymouth Rock. I remember Malcolm X saying that uh, we, we didn't arrive at Plymouth Rock. Plymouth Rock landed on us, you know. 
Um, and, and I love that because it's, it, it speaks volumes to our, our history, the history of African Americans in this, in this culture. But I think we need to have communications, we need to have conversations specifically between people who are African and people who are Indian because we are in our own unique historic space. We are not, the, it's not the, the pioneer narrative, the Mayflower narrative is not our narrative. The native people were already here for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. And the African people were indigenous to Africa. And so those two groups literally have a lot in common, but it's an interesting thing that those two groups sometimes have a, this a relationship that has been antagonistic because of how history plays out. So there's no place or greater place for healing than to have these important conversations in our national parks. National parks are great places, great environments for racial healing, for cultural healing, to go beyond what the history has taught us to that place where we can learn from the future and bind together. And so I think those conversations are important ones that I'm looking forward to participating in at some point in the future, because the part of me that is indigenous to this continent is getting along just fine with the part of me that's indigenous to Africa. So if I can harmonize within myself, we can harmonize within that, that greater world as well. Emily, do you have another question for the online audience? I do. Another question that's been upvoted on this question is from Hannah. As a Black woman in environmental sciences, I resonate deeply with what you've said about the importance of African Americans reconnecting to the place, to place and nature. Thank you so much for your words. One thing I struggle with at times is validating my work among all other struggles ongoing in the Black community. For example, police violence, poverty, and other forms of racism. How do you position your work in terms of racial justice and Black struggles? And how do you explain the value of your work to others in the Black community? Well, the thing is, uh, I'm, I'm not a historian. I'm a storyteller. And the story that I tell is powerful enough and true enough and honest enough that I feel that it can change the world. It can change specifically how African-Americans see themselves in this world. Because the world seems just so intimidating and the challenges ahead of us seem so intimidating. But I think of it this way, we come from strong stock. We tend to look at the middle passage in a negative light. We tend to look at slavery in a, in a negative light. I don't look at it that way. I don't look at the fact that my ancestors were enslaved in a negative light. I look at it in a positive light. Why? Because I say to myself, I think I had a bad day. What sort of day did they have every day of their life that would make my problems seem absolutely insignificant? My ancestors survived the Middle Passage. My ancestors survived the coffin ships. My ancestors survived the Trail of Tears. My ancestors beat the United States during the Seminole Indian Wars. If my ancestors can do that, then I can get through this day today. And I can imagine a tomorrow that I will have some measure of control over. And I it's, it's a myth. I won't have measure of control over tomorrow but I can have a measure of control over my response to what creator has given me in that, in that tomorrow. And so, so I, I, am a, I have a very positive outlook when I look at the future, even in spite of what I see in the present, I have a very positive outlook because I already know that the future is coming to pass. You know, when Martin Luther King said that I, I may not get there with you, but, 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 and he was referencing the promised land. Well, it's happening. The, the dawn is breaking. We've already had an African-American become president of the United States. We, are, we have an African-American, Bob Stanton, who became the first African-American director of the National Park Service. We've had a, a Latino as director of the National Park Service. We've had women as directors of the National Park Service. And keep in mind, if that sort of change can take place, then all sorts of changes that we think as being unlikely will, may come to pass, will come to pass if we have the will. So from my point of view, it's not that I'm an optimist, it's just that I, I can see and believe. And if I can see and believe it, it's strong enough, I know it's gonna happen if we all share that vision, if we all share that hope, if we all share that passion and simply work together. There's no 
amount of things that we can accomplish when we work together to achieve something that is true and that is just. Like Martin Luther King said, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it does eventually descend toward justice. And I'm following that rainbow where it ends. And it still is the ending in the United States of America. And we one day will be states that are united in an America that has not yet existed, but will one day come to pass. It's inevitable. The future has already been born. They're all in the third grade and they're really cute. <laughs> <laughs> well, as I've always said, whenever we have these conversations, we could talk all night. However, um, we have five minutes um, and I promised that I would close this out in a timely, in a timely manner. Um, Shelton, thank you very much for joining us this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for being here. I'd like to turn the evening over to uh, Dean Robbins to close us out for the night. I don't want to stop it, but Shelton's got to go save the world. And, you know, he's a busy person. So I, I got to call it uh, a night at 725 as, uh, as, as preordained. Um, I usually have to end this thing by saying, well, that was amazing because that's my job, I'm paid to say that. Um, yeah, well, that was amazing. Um, and I, I've got a five-year-old, Shelton. I, I'm thinking hard. I'm thinking really, really hard. Uh, and you know, in Everett Fox's translation, the great Hebrew scholar of the five books of Moses, the Genesis begins, at the beginning, the world was wild. And I think that's right. And I wanna thank you very much. I'd like to thank everybody uh, for coming out. And I'd like one last big thank you to Shelton Johnson for sharing tonight. And Shelton, you can tune out for this last bit, but I've got to say this, this doesn't happen for free. Uh, we, are, uh, we, we are, of course, part of this university. We train students. That is what we do with our tuition to create the next generation of leadership, hopefully in the national parks. Uh, and elsewhere uh, around the environment. But uh, these things need your support. Uh, your support is what brought Shelton Johnson here today. It's what uh, supports James Mills' work with us. Please, uh, Gibson, any amount are deeply, deeply appreciated at the Nelson Institute. There ain't a penny wasted. It all goes to transformative, thoughtful programming for people and for the earth. So thank you all for coming out. Thank you to Shelton Johnson. Thank you to James Mills. And we will all see you all again very, very soon. Thank you very much. Good night, everyone. Thank you. I believe we're hosting a reception of some kind. Are we not? We are. Where are we going? <laughs> Shelton, get on a plane. There's a reception. There's I'm already there. right back here, folks. So everybody <laughs> who, is, who went through the trouble of donning a mask and coming in person, there is a, a reception right back here. I didn't fully grok that. <laughs> so I'm here to cover your back. <laughs> Thank you, James. You bet. Um, Sheldon, I will see you next month. Um, enjoy what remains of this beautiful day. And um, thanks again for joining us. Good night. My pleasure. Ask, ask, him, if he, ask him if he had a chance to hear Will and